Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, present here in seminar and who join virtually uh, at Zoom and Facebook. Actually, uh, today's uh, lecture is supposed to chair by Professor Prathma Banerjee, uh, but she's not well, so the responsibility comes to me. So I I welcome you. Uh, today we are going to have a lecture titled Ambedkar Duby and Evolution of Pragmatism in India by Professor uh, Scott D. Stroud. How you pronounce your name? Stroud. Stroud, sorry. So uh, Professor Stroud is an Associate Professor of Communication Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. He writes on various topics in ethics, rhetoric, and philosophy. He is author of two academic books, John Dewey and the Artful Life, and Kant and the Promise of Rhetoric. And he is also co-founder of the first Center for John Dewey Studies in India at Savitabai Sabati, oh, Phule, Pune University. And his, today he's going to speak uh, from his new book, the evolution of pragmatism in India. And uh, I have not read the book, but I have read uh, many of the article on which the book is based. And I was amazed by uh, his, uh, his the way of the working, especially the historian work. So he goes even uh, uh, to collect the original books, uh, read by the Ambedkar and the way he marks, uh, use the different color of pencils uh, and to understand. And even he could uh, dig off um, uh, the first unpublished uh, of for, for wider publication, uh, uh, the Buddha and his Dharma. And he could see uh, the he used the the time remain between the both first book and second book and try to say and his correspondence with one of the his student whom Ambedkar asked from England to send some book of uh, Dewey to highlight the impact of Dewey in his uh, book uh, Buddha and Dharma. It's very fascinating methodology. I really uh, love and appreciate as, as a historian. So, sir, I think you have 40 to 50 minutes to speak and then we will have a question answer. So, please. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, CSDS, for you know offering this stage. If you will share my slides. Uh... The book has many more details than I have, but the slides might be more entertaining. Uh, but I, I stumbled into this project in 2004. 2004, go ahead and share the slides there. And the um, 2004, I was told by Martha Nussbaum <clears throat> when I was talking to her at a conference, she knew I was doing a dissertation on John Dewey, the American pragmatist. And she said, hey, have you heard of this student of Dewey's Embedkar from India? Because she knew I was also into Indian matters. And so, I was a grad student, so I thought I knew everything. But I, uh, I said, nah, and I brushed it aside. And then 10 years later, in 2014, when I was on fellowship and I was supposed to be writing a book on John Dewey and rhetorical criticism, I do what all academics do. I procrastinated. And luckily, my procrastination strategy was to Google Bim Rao and Bedkar. And so I got Annihilation of Caste, of course, as the first hit. I started reading it, and I started seeing Dewey where others had seen Dewey. And I started to see Dewey where others hadn't seen Dewey. And so I started to sense there was a story to be told here. And so from spring of 2015 on, I've been madly engaged in this project. Uh, and so we really, it's a project of, we'll see if my slide clicker, can you click on the slideshow and maybe this, uh, there we go. Uh, so it's it's a historical story that'll interest some. It's also a conceptual story. Maybe that'll interest others. And the conceptual story is, what does American pragmatism have to do with Buddhism and political thought in India? Many people say nothing. But as you'll see, there is a historical story and a conceptual story why this might be the case. Now, uh, you know, everyone knows, you know, once I got the smell that there was a story here about pragmatism and India, I started looking. I looked at all the great writers from India and the U.S. that it recounted Baba Sahib's life, that recounted his thought, and almost every one of them, they tried to have a more general scope, would mention Ambedkar's time at Columbia. They'd mention Ambedkar's relationship with Dewey, but they would never give details. They, they'd say he mattered, but then they'd never say how. 
uh, almost inevitably, they refer to the great letter to Embedkar wrote to his uh, wife, Savita Embedkar, when he had landed and he got in his hotel across the street from Columbia and he learned that uh, John Dewey had died two days before while he was on the plane, basically. And Embedkar laments to his wife, you know, this was so sad. I was looking forward to seeing Dewey. I owe my whole intellectual life to him. You know, so everyone will mention these facts, but there's no more facts they can give. And I found this profoundly unsatisfying. Uh, you know, CSDS's own Professor Vajpayee has a line in one of her awesome blog posts that said, the initial encounter between Embedkar and Dewey is lost and cannot be reconstructed. And so when I hear things like this, I like rooting for the underdog. And so I say, well, why can't we reconstruct those? And so my book represents 120,000 words of digging into the Embedkar Dewey story. <clears throat> Some people do not want to hear that much about Dewey and in relation to Embedkar. That's fine. But this book will be a testament to that. So again, think of the pro project as having two dimensions, a historical dimension. What is Embedkar's relationship with Dewey? What can we say about this in a historically evidenced sense? And then conceptual, uh, which, you know, remember, I'm a philosopher by highest training. So this is my first time doing historical work, getting into archives, literally getting my hands dirty. So now I have a whole new respect for people that do archival work. Uh, but, you know, there's a well, a philosophical story here of interest too. The idea that Embedkar has a new entry into this diverse and global pantheon of thinkers we class as pragmatists. So this project has driven me to India about five or six times, searching out any kind of document or archival research that can get me into the mind of Embedkar, that can reveal Embedkar's education, that can uh, show me the choices or considerations or possibilities he was considering behind his published works, right? Because we have what he wrote, but what lies behind that? You know, can we recover that mind and its evolution? So I've been to any spot from Raj Graha uh, to Symbiosis to Siddharth College to Malin College to private collectors, anyone that has notebooks of Embedkar, scraps of paper by, written on by Embedkar, books that he owned and annotated to try to flesh out this and it's been one of the most rewarding projects of my life and uh, so let me let me tell you about some of the details the details come out in painful detail in my books published in the United States by University of Chicago Press and the the same book gets published here in India by Harper Collins and they're both titled The Evolution of Pragmatism in India the American edition highlights the rhetorical aspect to it uh, in the subtitle but the Indian edition changes that but again they're the the same project and you know really uh, you know, this book, again, is the most comprehensive look at the Dewey and Bedkar story. Too many people, I mean, there's a use to it. A lot of people will hold up Dewey and they'll hold up in Bedkar and they'll say, they're the same. He must have had this kind of influence. Or they'll hold them up and they'll say they're different. Look, Dewey went beyond, or in Bedkar went beyond Dewey. And really, this is not doing justice to either thinker. Dewey authored 8 million words over his collected works of 38 volumes. And Bedkar's English volumes in Boz, I estimated over 4 million words. So these thinkers thought different things. They thought different times. They thought, you know, and Bedkar did not read all of Dewey at once. And so this story is incredibly complex. So when I talk of the evolution of pragmatism in India, I mean how Bedkar engages specific parts of the evolving Dewey thought and then does something new in India with this. So let's talk about this story. I should have, you know, I, I had an idea in 2014, 15, there was a story here. And as I started coming to India, I should have got, you know, onto this story earlier. But I, for instance, you know, pictured on the slide here is a hundred year old book that we know Embedkar got in Columbia University because he was in the habit of signing his Columbia books back then. And so this one's signed by Embedkar in October, 1914. And, you know, it's a, it's a book by Dewey on the influence of Darwin in philosophy. Now, if you want to know, sometimes when I'm in India, people ask, well, who are Dewey's gurus? I've had this question asked before. You know, and well, in a sense, Dewey had two gurus, Dar Darwin and Hegel. You know, so think of Dewey's philosophy as combining, impossible as it might be, a naturalistic Darwinianism with Hegel's form of kind of reasoning and dialectical change. So anyway, here's a book on Darwin, and Bedkar had it. As you'll see in a second, Embedkar got this in the first month of his first class with Dewey, but jammed in the back of it was a clue. And I had missed this the first time I held this book. But the second time, I found this scratch piece of paper. You can tell because it's ripped from another larger piece of paper. And it has ink blot. Embedkar loved his ink pens. But it, ha it has a word that a young student was probably perplexed by, manifold, occurs on page 218 of this book. Uh, but what else does it have? It has Embedkar experimenting with his signature. 
not yet the beautiful version that you'd see on the Constitution signatory page, but what else is there? He signs John Dewey's name twice. So Dewey was on his mind and on his page. And this really rammed home to me the idea that Embedkar is a human like you and me. He didn't just make arguments. He didn't just pursue social justice. He dreamed, he doodled. And what was he doodling in October of 1914? John Dewey. I've never found any of his other professors that made his doodle sheets. A bigger clue, maybe a more important clue for stories of Embedkar unearthed at the, the Dewey Center in America, the original Dewey Center. It's Southern Illinois University Carbondale. Now, you know, I, I was always curious how Dewey can captivate anyone, because by all accounts, Dewey was an incredibly boring lecturer. <laughs> he was not a good speaker. In China, thousands would show up, even though they didn't understand him, just to hear Mr. Science, Mr. Democracy. But, but at any rate, he wasn't an oratorical powerhouse. Of course, Ambedkar was. But, you know, so what, why did students gravitate towards him? And so one way into that kind of historical black box of his classroom, uh, you could start to look at people who took his class, what they say about him. And of course, a lot of them said he was boring. But I found one recollection that others hadn't noticed as applicable to Ambedkar's story. It was a very long recollection, an audio recollection by Nima Adlerblum. She was a philosopher and uh, she, she herself was Jewish. She was concerned with Jewish philosophy. She did a, a, a dissertation under Dewey on a Jewish philosopher, but she was with Dewey for a long time. After 1926, when she graduated, she stuck around New York and Dewey circles. She ends up organizing the big birthday party in 1948 or so that Nehru came to and said, when he gets in trouble, he gets in a, a tough spot. He reads Dewey's works to get him out of it. So, so she's been orbiting around Dewey for a long time. And in 1966, some 50 years after when she was officially a student at Columbia, she wrote, she tells uh, someone recording these things, uh, her recollections. So she had this long, detailed recollection talking about Dewey in the classroom. She talked about the students from China and Japan. Dewey had a lot of those, especially from China. They end up dragging him to, well, Japan and China. And, you know, that's interesting to me. And then she came to a paragraph or a passage that almost made my heart stop. Luckily, it didn't because the book would have not been done. But she, she starts recalling a student from India, a student from India. She never names this student. And it's just in one paragraph she talks about this student. And in the book, I hash out the complete paragraph and why I think it must be referring to Embedkar. But here, I give you the majority of the paragraph. And, and I'll read it because it is apocal, I think. So, And notice at the bottom of this, I give you a picture of her husband's letterhead. He was a student of Seligman during the same time Embedkar was a student of Seligman. And so she was around the campus, right? You know, 1915, she was, you know, a 10 minute walk from campus. So, so at any rate, she writes in this recollection, she says in this recollection, there was also a student from India whom I saw daily, always with a pen and a paper, he was reading Dewey's articles. And we would ponder together the many ideas. He recopied the class notes after each lecture. Whenever he read some to me, it felt as if I heard Dewey himself talking, not a single word omitted. He also showed me his attached comments, searching for a bridge between Dewey and Buddhism. Both, he said, aim at the highest morality, but Dewey's drive for a good society might be more conducive to happiness than nirvana. In the United States, he met Dewey, who gave a new turn to his life. In infusing Dewey's concept of an idealistic democracy, he may be of some help in easing the ugly, ingrained tradition of the untouchables. So again, that was, re that was recorded over 50 years from when she was actively a student there. But so many of the details, too many of the details match up with Embedkar. We have recollections from Savita Embedkar that Embedkar decades afterwards of his time at uh, Columbia would imitate the mannerisms and the speaking style of John Dewey to a T. Uh, we, we have indications that, uh, you know, Embedkar obviously was concerned with caste and the untouchability problem. You know, you have no other students of Dewey's that you can identify that were Indian. And uh, the few Indian students at Columbia you could identify weren't enamored by Dewey and definitely weren't enamored by solving the caste problem. They're all focused on self-rule or Indian independence. So this has to be Embedkar. And what I think it does is it shakes up our received narratives, right? I've heard so many received narratives that, ah, oh, Dewey was important, then Embedkar moved on to other things like Buddhism. Or Dewey was just one of many teachers. But if Adler Blum is right, and she's referring to Dewey or Embedkar, you get this vision of Embedkar not wanting to replace Buddhism with pragmatism or pragmatism with Buddhism, but from his earliest days, combining them. 
And this makes sense of things like why nirvana only appears four or so times in Buddha and his Dhamma, the Buddhist Bible, and why he talks about Buddhism as a form of democracy so overtly. So, so let's follow Adler Blum's hint out. And again, this is a passage and a connection that no one in India or America has ever noticed or ever found. And I think it forces Dewey into our stories about Embedkar in a very clear way. So again, I'll talk about the historical aspect. What did Embedkar learn from Dewey? And then the conceptual aspect, what are some of the parameters of Embedkar's philosophy considered as a pragmatism? So many will ask me, what is pragmatism? You know, various people in America know little to a lot about Embedkar. People in India know little to a lot about pragmatism. But if I had to put pragmatism in a nutshell, what I mean by that is I'm pointing to a tradition of thinkers that arises after the American Civil War, includes well-read, frequently read people like William James, Charles Saunders Peirce, John Dewey. It also includes people that should be read more, like Jane Addams. Like in Bedkar, she gets pigeonholed as an actor, an activist, and not as a thinker, so she gets left out, but she was as much of a thinker as John Dewey. It includes figures like W.B. Du Bois, who Embedkar wrote to in 1946, who himself was a student of William James at Harvard. So, so a part of my project is to add Embedkar to this kind of expanding list of thinkers. What else do I mean by pragmatism? Well, simply put, I don't mean uniformity. Oftentimes people, there's even a blog post out there that just simplistically says, oh, Embedkar moved beyond Dewey's pragmatism. This is a very simple and flat-footed reading of pragmatism. If you've spent 20 minutes on any of these pragmatists, James and Peirce, for instance, you will find immediately that James and Peirce differ on many, many things. So there is not identity among those that we consider pragmatists. So what do we mean? What do I mean? What do historians of philosophy mean when they talk about pragmatists? They mean two levels sometimes intertwined. First, a historical line of influence. People that read each other, people that responded to each other, people that took classes from each other. In some cases, people that overtly resisted the views they were seeing in others. Okay, so in Bedkar, I'm going to make the case in a very strong fashion in this book that he is a historical pragmatist because he's reading Dewey, he's resisting parts of Dewey, he's changing parts of Dewey. Two, there's a conceptual similarity that you can make the argument that pragmatism means a certain way of thinking. A certain constellation of ideas inevitably in, appears in most of these people I point to as pragmatists. Experience matters, not just theory, but experience. Things like community, scientific communities of inquirers, democratic communities of citizens, uh, and education tends to take foreground. So, for instance, in 1938, Ambedkar authors a wonderfully aggressive piece called Is Gandhi a Mahatma? And in his argument against Gandhi being a Mahatma, Ambedkar says, well, and, you know, Gandhi talked about Satya and Ahimsa, but the, the Buddha talked about these much earlier. The Buddha was, and he quotes, you know, he says exactly, the Buddha was a pragmatist when it came to truth. So, so you know, that's Embedkar using the term pragmatist, not in a historical sense, but in a conceptual sense. Truth is what works. Truth is what helps you get through experience in the future, not just what aligns with the mind of God. So, so there's those two senses. And again, I don't mean identity here. Well, one thing you notice in the corner there, there's a, a young student from China. That's the, the famous reformer in China, Hu Shi. Now, in my book, I lay forward the archival sources that I think for the first time prove that Hu Shi took the same classes in Bedkar in 1915, 1916. Everyone knows Hu Shi took classes with Dewey, goes back to China, brings Dewey and his pragmatism back there, does things. One of the note takers in the audience for Dewey's lecture is a young Mao. When Mao wins, he uh, puts forward three million plus words published, you know, by his scholars, castigating and demonizing Husher, his reformers, and John Dewey. So, in many ways, and many people have written on this. I'm by no means the first right, writing on Husher in China as a pragmatist. So, it always struck me as odd that pragmatism loses in China, but no one has started to tell the story of pragmatism in India where pragmatism plays a great role, an important role in the writing of the constitution that defines the world's largest democracy. So who sure sat in that same class, 1516 with Embedkar, and they both go their separate ways shortly thereafter and their countries go different ways. Now let's talk about some of the parameters. Again, everyone knows Embedkar took Dewey at Columbia, but usually that's where the story stops. And so I wanted to push deeper. So you find his transcripts at places like University of Mumbai's library in the Karmode collection. And you can see his courses listed out. And from that, you can see some details. He took five philosophy classes. 
two are from a gentleman named Montague, William Pepperell Montague, who is a realist philosopher who opposed Dewey's pragmatism. Those, if you look closely, have a D next to them. And Bedkar dropped those courses. So the three philosophy courses he stuck to through the end were the three by Dewey, philosophy 231, 131, and 132. So I like to say when it came to his philosophical preferences, Embedkar voted for pragmatism with his feet. So he took three philosophy classes, but as you'll see in this talk in this book, they, they really exercised an outsize influence. Sure, he was influenced by Seligman on taxation policy, but when it comes to his discussion of voting or social democracy, taxation policy doesn't make it there. But I, have, I would argue that his views of social democracy influenced some of the things he did in economics. So, so I want to take these three courses very seriously. Uh, how do we know they're Dewey's courses? You look at the course bulletins and you see that Dewey was teaching those classes. But again, I kept wanting to go deeper and deeper, and you'll see how I do this in a second. Mm -hmm. Now, after 1916, when he leaves Morningside Heights, I've never found any evidence anywhere, India, U.S., private collections, whatnot, that Dewey or Embedkar wrote each other. Okay, so I've never found any instance that they contacted each other after 1916. But I do have a lot of evidence that Embedkar kept tabs on what Dewey was doing. And you have that in all of the collections of the remains of Embedkar's renowned 50,000 book library that's now largely housed at Symbiosis has some books, the Dart College has a lot of books, Malin College has a lot of these books. And so you see here a list of all the books I've been able to identify and hold uh, that that were by Dewey or about Dewey. So about 22 or 23, I don't know, I'm not good at math, but it's a lot of books. A lot of them, he had multiple copies. So like, for instance, Democracy and Education, he had four copies of it. So, so this says something. No one else, including Marx, Seligman, whoever, has close to this amount of books that are in the surviving catches of his books. Like Marx, there's two copies of some kind of 1940s later reader of Marx, Lenin, and Stalin collected works or selected works. But, you know, there's just no other author comes close to this. So, so it's fascinating. And Bedkar and Dewey, it was a very distanced, one-sided, respectful, intellectual relationship. He wasn't writing Dewey letters saying, hey, what's up? And Dewey wasn't sending him letters, hey, nice job on the Constitution. So it may not be the kind of relationship I want to forge with my awesome students, but it is what it is in a historical sense. And what it is is important. You also have evidence that this, this relationship, this kind of observation, this monitoring by Baba Sahib continued in more engaged fashion. So here's a note card. This is one way that Embedkar would take notes on things he thought were worth reading. And here you have him talking about Dewey. The first line is a quotation from Dewey. The second line, as near as I can figure it, is Embedkar's summary of Dewey's philosophy. It's not in any Deweyan work. And then at the bottom, and importantly for my purposes, you see two works, one about Dewey, which surprised me. I didn't know Dewey had any wit. He's pretty dry. And then the second one is uh, Knower, The Knowing and the Known, but with Dewey and Bentley. And now that both of those books were authored and published in 1949. So this note card has to be from his final years. So it shows you it's false to say Embedkar engaged Dewey in the Columbia years and then moved on. So what are we going to make of all this? I make a lot of, you know, I, I, I try to make the most rigorous case in my book possible because I found it's too easy for people to say, ah, there were many teachers, let's move on. So let me tell, give you a hint of what kind of case I have in store for those kind of skeptics. One, I want to argue that there's a major theme that's in Embedkar that's related to pragmatism and therefore it could be construed as kind of a theme of his new vehicle, pragmatism, cast as a habit. Second, and Bedkar's pragmatism rotates around these concerns and these attractions to force. Force is the ways you get things done in reform, but force is also a worry for reformers. And then the third theme, unique to Dewey, or excuse me, and Bedkar in a very significant way, is the prizing of religion, right? Dewey gives up on religion. Later in his life, I've heard it said that someone asked Dewey why he didn't send his kids to Sunday school. And Dewey suppo you know, supposedly responded to this person. You know, Dewey's mom was highly religious. She would ask her kids, young Dewey included, are you right with Jesus, et cetera. So Dewey responded to this later interlocutor. I went to enough Sunday school in my youth for my whole family's sake. So, so Dewey gave up on organized religion. And what he wrote on religion didn't emphasize doctrines or dogmas. Okay, so, so very watered down in some senses, a common faith as a common denominator, so to speak. So, so do, you know, Dewey talked about religion, but not in a live way. And Bedkar makes religion kind of the vehicle 
to enunciate his social de democratic thought in his final years. So religion becomes a means. So let's talk about each of these in turn. The first one, cast as a habit. Again, Embedkar's education in all the accounts I can find is treated as a black box. Everyone knows young Beam went into Columbia University, got exposed to a bunch of progressive pr professors in economics, political history, taxation policy, whatever, anthropology. And then he came out, changed and energized as a young reformer, but it's still a black box. We don't know what happened there, right? So I, you know, I try to figure, and Bedkar is not on TikTok, or I'd be able to see what sandwiches he ate for what lunch. So, you know, how do you get into a hundred year old daily routine? So he didn't leave di diaries back then. So one of the things I found as an entry point was, well, Dewey's a famous person. And oftentimes people collect things and save things and archive things connected to famous people. So I took those courses that I knew Dewey taught and Bedkar took. And I went to places like the Dewey Center for Dewey Studies at Carbondale, Southern Illinois University Carbondale, which has a wonderfully complex archive of Dewey's works. And there's always undiscovered things to find in there. And so I started looking looking for those years, those semesters. And so for instance, for philosophy 231, that's psychological ethics, I was able to find Dewey's lecture notes, what he outlined in incredibly messy handwriting, which I don't thank him for, uh, what he was gonna say to his students, what he was planning on saying and most likely said some version of. I also found handouts that he gave to various iterations of that course, generic handouts on the Stoics and Greek philosophers, et cetera. Surely Young Beam prized those as a shortcut into the Western mind. I found notes taken by other students. You know, there were notes taken by other students because they refer to Dewey in the third person. Uh, you know, and so you use these kind of documents to kind of see what happened in this class. And what do you see happen in this class? You see a certain aspect of Dewey revealed to Embedkar, not all 8 million words, but a certain aspect, a very naturalized psychology, a psychology that prized intelligence in reforming our habits. And a certain psychology said the key to ethics comes down to habits and attitudes of the living organisms or creatures humans are. So for instance, in some of the student or stenographer accounts of this class, you see Dewey talking to his students about impulses. And opposed to certain Christian philosophers' ways of reading impulses as inherently bad, you see Dewey you know, toe the line that impulses are neutral and in many ways are indeterminate. They aren't just as simple as perhaps Freud would set them out to be. Uh, they're, they're, you know, innate drivings of the individual, but they can be channelized through experience or through controlled experience. And so Dewey here talks about education. For instance, Embedkar never took, to my knowledge or the evidence I've seen, he never took any classes on pedagogy or education at Columbia. I think where he got education from Dewey was reading Democracy Education, which he bought in 1917 in London, or through classes like this when Dewey talks about psychology as dealing with education in general. So you start to see this picture of habit, of mental attitude as being key to Dewey. And it's normative, right? I mean, Dewey's talking about attitudes not as just nail biting or violin playing, but as things that empower and, and value objects in the world. And so attitudes toward objects or towards situations become key parts to how we react. And these reactions can be useful or not so useful, not so intelligent. So this, you know, when I was engaging in Bedcar again and again, this started to connect some dots. For instance, in 1936, in Bedcar's infamous and undelivered address, Annihilation of Caste, pa you know, paints a picture of caste in a way that was kind of jarred with some of my ways and the things I read's ways of talking about social justice, right? For instance, in the West and probably in India as well, you talk about things like racism, sexism, as systemic matters, as institutional matters, as large things. I have the hand gesture down for it, I bet. So they're larger things, right? They're beyond any individual. So, so in Bedkar's way of talking about these matters, at least in Annihilation, we're incredibly grounded. They're grounded between our ears and our habits, our attitudes. And so this was something that called out for further reflection. You know, I needed to have an answer to this. And some of those answers came when I saw those Dewey notes, you see, because Dewey's you know, talking about us as living organisms. And here's Embedkar talking about caste as a notion or a state of mind. And that changing things like caste don't just require systemic changes, but they require initially, perhaps as a starting point, the kind of attitudinal changes that will add up to systems and organizational changes. So for instance, when he talks about reform and annihilation, he talks about reform consisting in a change of attitudes. And notice how he talks about maybe the most general form of talking about caste. 
these four labels. And, you know, he says, the, you know, Embedkar talks about these as having a certain normative value, especially the lower caste. When people hear them, he says they, they initiate a feeling of disgust. You know, later in the Annihilation, he talks like this. Well, that's what Dewey was getting at with attitudes having a normative dimension, an attitude towards an object that has a value basis. So, so Embedkar is taking parts of Dewey's psychology and engaging topics that Dewey knew a little bit about, but didn't care much about. Dewey was not engaged in the battle against caste. Now let's talk about the next theme, force. Force is something important. You know, it's how you get things done in the world is by pushing towards your goals. So philosophy 131, 132, that's the class that Chinese reformer who sure was in. He heard the exact same things in Bedkar did, yet his philosophy, his instrumentalism, was is radically different than Embedkar's, but that's another story for another day. But what did those two students hear from Dewey in that class? Well, they heard things like the famous slogan of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity. I know for a fact that Embedkar and Husher heard that in March of 1916, because we have the notes. So you see on this slide, this is a, a picture from the notes. So again, there, you know, people save things connected to Dewey. I wasn't able to find Dewey's own lecture notes. I heard he even crumples them in class sometimes, and he didn't even save them. But, but at any rate, I didn't find those yet. I haven't found them yet. But I did find two students who saved their notes from his class. One did half the, the year. The other one did the whole year. And students, like all humans, get sick and can't make class. So sure enough, there are three days that the original note taker couldn't make class. And who do you see as the note taker <laughs> indicated in the notes? Embedkar. So we know for a fact that this is the series of classes that Embedkar heard. We know for a fact he had five classes on Fichte. We know for a fact he had like three classes on Hegel, three classes on Marx. So, so we know what Dewey was leading him through. And so part of that, when he got to the French Revolution, he talks about liberty, equality, fraternity. And of course, Dewey didn't make much of those. They appear in Dewey's early works, but then they disappear from Dewey's philosophy largely later on in life. And by the time Embedkar hears Dewey's philosophy, these aren't a staple of Dewey's writings. But as you know, it, you know in Embedkar's works, they become a touchstone. And I think it's because they were a semi-transcendent ideal. They rose above context and culture of the immediate present, and they allowed Embedkar to criticize his immediate present. So they become important for Embedkar in very serious ways. They become his way of breaking out of his culture and trying to reform that culture without abandoning it altogether. So in 1949, you see him refer in a famous speech to social democracy, underlying political democracy, and how does he operationalize it? It's an attitude or a way of life that recognizes liberty, equality, and fraternity. So uh, back to our theme, force. Sometimes I've found that the, the most intriguing new things we can say about Embedkar happen in those regions where Embedkar does something that's hard to explain and we're tempted to jump over it. And one of those things I couldn't quite put my finger on why Embedkar spent the time he did was a book review he wrote in 1918. One of the first things he did, now this is the period when he's having trouble getting work, having trouble getting lodging, this is when the infamous Parsi Inn incident happened. So something compelled young Embedkar when he got back to India to author the only book review I've ever found among his collected works. It's of a British philosopher named Bertrand Russell. Furthermore, it's of a philosopher who was an opponent of Dewey. Furthermore, it was a book by this philosopher, famous in his own right, I, I grant you that, but it had nothing to do with India. And it was in an Indian eco economics journal that was largely read by Indian audiences that, you know, that, that probably shouldn't care anything about Bertrand Russell's book. So it just stuck out to me as so odd. So every biography, every you know, kind of expansive account of Embedkar always mentions this and moves on. But I think it's one of the first instances of Embedkar developing in print his sort of meliorism, his sort of idea that education can happen outside of the classroom and can happen through political and social advocacy. Now, why did you review Bertrand Russell's book? Well, you start looking at the book, and sure, it's on World War I. You know, Russell was a famous pacifist who hated that war and got thrown in jail because of his opposition. And so you see passages like this one, where Bertrand Russell, you know, kind of is cynical, maybe realistic, about the, the Brits making demons out of the Germans and the Germans making demons out of the Brits and all of this to motivate just a cycle of violence that in the end would not improve anyone. And Russell makes this observation that when the oppressed win their freedom, 
or destroy the oppressor's ability to oppress, they become as oppressive as their former masters. So, so it's a, you know it's kind of a cynical look at reform in some ways. You know, war could be a sense of instantiating your vision of the world. And so, so I'm sure young Embedkar was intrigued and captivated by this because it spoke to a problem he was interested in, not World War I, although that claimed a ship full of his books. But uh, you know, he was interested in reform and justice and overcoming who he saw as his oppressors. And to do that, he doesn't want to be as oppressive as those people. So in this review, you see Embedkar engaging his, you know, he talks about his Indian audience and he worries about them reading this book review and seeing a justification of quietism, of passivity. And he evokes his professor, John Dewey, explicitly on forces violence, forces energy. And Embedkar's line is that Russell's mostly right, but he's not clear enough. And Dewey's distinction would really show you the right way to take uh, you know, Russell. Now, I always thought this review was referring to Gandhi. But if you look closely at the wording that Bertrand Russell uses in his book and Embedkar uses in his review, it's, these are all in English, of course, he uses non-resistance. You know, and Gandhi at this period in his life was dissatisfied with passive resistance. He kept using that. In 1919, he finally really puts forward Satyagraha. So, so I think he was referring to not Gandhi, but to Tolstoy. Because when I found these notes, when I found these notes from you know, the classmates of Embedkar, what you hear Dewey talking about is fascinating. Dewey's engaging Tolstoy and he uses the phrase non-resistance. And Tolstoy, as Dewey portrays him, was against criminal laws, police, jails, you know, Tolstoy had a very radical critique of force as having any good aspect to it. And so Dewey, of course, thinks that you need force to get anything done. So in these lectures, uh, young Beam starts hearing Dewey make distinctions that would be very relevant for the pursuit of reform, all the while being humble enough to be sensitive, you could become the next oppressor that someone else wants to get rid of. Interestingly enough, you see in these notes, Dewey makes some very simplistic references to Buddhism. Now, two things could be the case here. Uh, young and Bedkar could be pulling his hair out thinking, my great professor doesn't truly understand Buddhism. You know, and I think that's true. Dewey did not have a good, complex reading of Buddhism. But if the Adler Blum recollections are right, young Bimrao and Bedkar might not have been too, you know, uh, nonplussed by this. He might have, you know, according to her, wanted to combine social democracy with Buddhism and de-emphasize things like nirvana as merely individual spiritual enlightenment. So the challenge for Dewey's, for Embedkar's pragmatism from 1918 to the end of his life is this. It, you know, how can a reformer muster the means of change, the forces that can get things done to make the world a better place, depending on their vision of what that means, all the while maintaining a fragile balance among equality, liberty, and fraternity? So let's talk about theme three, where we start seeing Embedkar make even more explicit and explicitly new commitments to some of these means. Now, again, Embedkar loved religion. You know, he was, religion was both the problem and the solution in Embedkar's worldview. Dewey, religion too often was, you know, indicated a problematic, dogmatic way of thinking. Dewey later in his life recounted to one of his students that said, you know, religion wants you to believe, philosophy wants you to think or to question. You can't have both. And so Dewey gave up on a combination between religion and philosophy. There's more to say on Dewey on religion, of course, but Embedkar definitely did not see any kind of opposition between these two. Of course, some religions would be more useful than others. So, so Buddhism becomes the vehicle at the end of his life. And if the Adler Blum recollection is accurate, towards the beginning, he wanted to make Buddhism a key part of this story, along with pragmatism. Now, in the Buddha and his Dhamma, you know, this is where most of his Buddhism comes out in its, you know, full, complete form, perhaps. You get a vision of Buddhism as a socially engaged philosophy. But never forget, it continues the things that Embedkar emphasized through his whole life that engage political philosophy from Dewey. So here you see an underlined passage from Embedkar's favorite book. He owned four copies of it from Dewey. It's Democracy and Education, published in 1916, but we know Embedkar got his earliest copy January 6, 1917, because he signed it from London. Uh, now you see some of Embedkar's characteristic underlinings here. I've made it a quest to hold and look at and you know, it, look, observe at every page mark he's made. So I, I've become familiar with his way of marking text. And I've, I've tried my best to ascertain 
a critical experiment using his published works, which always have dates, uh, to figure out, you know, when he was right, you know, mark, making marks, was there a system? Did one mark indicate he was going to use this passage for publication? Other marks, many disagreed or something. No, I, you know, there is no system in that sense. The best case I can give for the meaning of these marks, and I think it is still very significant, think about it. Everyone owns books, but doesn't read all of them. And the books we read, we don't read all of them. And the books we read, uh, we don't can't come back to. And Ambedkar's habit, as I've learned, was he had various tables in Raj Graha, basically a tomb built for his 30,000 books he housed there in Mumbai. And he had different tables. And these tables had different colored pens at them because, you know, they're scattered about. So, so what this means, this one passage here, you notice four different or three different kinds of underlining, at least colors, red, blue, and gray in the margins. This means he read, most likely read this passage three times, three different times. He kept coming back to it. So this is one of the most famous lines from Dewey's Democracy and Education. It appears with no mention of Dewey in Annihilation of Caste, and the Baugh's edition has it on the back of one of the volumes. And Bedkar is absolutely right to underline and echo this, because this is the Mahavakya from Dewey's works. A democracy is more than a form of government. It is primarily a mode of associated living, of conjoint communicated experience. Later in his life, Dewey would talk about it as a way of life, an attitude. So, so you start to see this come up more and more in Ambedkar's Buddhism. Another book he had two copies of, the 1908 book by Dewey called Ethics, and Ambedkar actually owned the 1910 British reissue. Uh, you see underlined passages, the same one in both books. It's this famous passage from Dewey where he expands upon the idea of rules and principles. And you see Dewey making the point that rules like thou shall not kill are very concrete, but they don't change to an impermanent, adjusting, uncertain world. Principles, however, like the golden rule from uh, Jesus, do change or do let you adapt your answers and solutions to a changing world. So, so Dewey you know, wanted an ethics of principles. Now, you see this passage appear in the Annihilation of Caste, but in a different context. And Bedkar marshals this distinction clearly from Dewey to talk about religion, right? What got him into trouble with Annihilation is he said, let's blow up religion. And then he says, well, I mean, a religion of rules. Religion of principles would still be very useful. Of course, later in his life, Buddhism becomes that religion of principles. You know, so when you look at the 1950s, when he really initiates his conversion campaign explicitly and in public, you see him refer again to principles. Interestingly enough, in this passage from a speech in 56, he talks about how Buddhism declined because it lacked versatile and conquering orators. Again, Dewey was very boring, and Bedkar was not. And what does he say? Embed Dewey or Buddhism lacked in its uh, years of decline people that can really persuasively proselytize it. Now let's think about another thing that appeared in those lecture notes. Dewey was highly committed to this dialectical relationship between individual and society. One thing about philosophers like Dewey and, and Bedkar, complex thinkers, to know what they argue, you have to know what they're pushing against in many cases. So one of the things Dewey was in, you know, concerned with was this view he called metaphysical individualism. The idea that like Locke or Hobbes or extreme forms of laissez-faire capitalism would subscribe to. The idea that individuals are just units, and then democracy comes out of that, society through social contracts come out of that, et cetera. Dewey did not like this. He was too much of a Hegelian to like that kind of individualism. So Dewey made extreme measures in his lectures and his works to make this argument that in many ways the individual is created by society, is formed by society. So, so he had this kind of dialectical battle he was fighting. But you know what Young and Bedkar must have sensed when he saw this in Dewey's social ethics? Another key part to this, right, for Dewey is that ethics and the ideals and the standards of ethics come from your community. Now, this kind of dialectical Hegelian type thinking would, would never do for young Bimrao and Bedkar, right? Because, why? Because Bedkar was committed to a path of reform that could not draw its standards or its ideals from the tradition it wanted to radically reform, right? I mean, he could not draw from moksha or dharma what he wants to say about the caste system. So it, what you see is you see an embed car, when you start looking at it through this lens, you see an embed car that puts forward not this problematic of how to dissolve the individual into the group in a Hegelian sense, but to find roles for the individual to exert pressure on that balance between individual and community and make the community move move towards reform, move, move towards a more just order. And this really came home to me in a vivid fashion when I held this book from Siddharth College. It's a 1948 book, no other marks in it, 
But on the table of contents page, you see in bed car scrawl out what he was thinking while he read this book on karma and rebirth, key topics in most Indian schools of thought, right? He writes quite clearly, what place has will and effort in the law of karma? So what you start to sense is that Ambedkar was worried about systems, about philosophies, about darshans that would eliminate the role of the individual to radically shape things up. No conquering orators, no reformers, in other words. So he wanted the individual to count. And you start to see this emphasis in other spots of his work. So for instance, the Buddha and his Dhamma, the final version, he took exquisite control over its physical size, its layout, and like what iconography appeared on every page. And on every page, there's a mudra right next to the page number in the original typesetting. And you see in a 1940s book held at Siddharth College in the archives called The Iconography of Tibetan Buddhism, a variety of marks. And in the section on mudras, there's only two marks. So you can literally see he's choosing between two mudras, abhyaya, protection or blessing, or tarjani, menacing. And it's fascinating to me to think about which one wins in his Buddhist gospel, his Buddhist Bible, tarjani. So next to every page in this Buddhist uh, you know, condensation of the Buddha's message is an assertive gesture and a gesture of menacing, a gesture of, of aggressiveness to some extent. And it's not like he wanted his Buddhism to be violent, of course, but he didn't want it to be passive or even seen as passive. It was a socially engaged Dhamma. So in Bedkar's Buddhism, I like to say is an assertive Buddhism. Now jump forward to his vow and you start to see old things in new ways if you adopt this pragmatist frame I explain in my book. So for instance, we all know he was, you know, he had the world's largest voluntary conversion in Nagpur. He and his wife Savita converted in a diksha ceremony of his own design involving 22 vows and then an estimated 300 to 600,000 converted right after him. This is all known, this has all been written about uh, verbatim, you know, ad infinitum. But you know, if you look at those vows, and you know what you now know about principles and rules and kind of this pragmatist outlook, what gives us flexibility, what doesn't, you start to see how some vows or rules do not steal, pretty straightforward, do not consume liquor, very straightforward. But some of the principles, maybe the most important principles, are principles. And so you see, I shall endeavor to establish equality, or I shall believe in the equality of mankind. These are principles in that classic pragmatist sense. Their application is challenging. But they're applicable in Embedkar's time. They're applicable in the day of TikTok and Facebook and hate speech on Twitter. So they give you an intelligent way to engage an ever-changing present. In Dewey's terms, in that 1908 book, they give you the tools to make yourself a reflective individual and not just someone that follows group customs or group habits to a T. Now look again at Buddha and his Dhamma. Of course, the Buddha and his Dhamma came out in a first edition called the Buddha and his Gospel in 1951. These are not identical texts. But for instance, there's a whole new book four in Buddha and his Dhamma that it talks about Karl Marx, talks about liberty, equality, fraternity, talks about ahimsa. This was not there in the first version. What happens between these versions? A bunch of stuff. One thing that happened was Embedkar was pestering a young Dalit student in London, V.B. Kadam, to get him and copy a book for him from Dewey on Democracy. In one of the most uh, you know, sad cases of a student uh, you know, expending effort they didn't need to, young V.B. Kadam follows these vague instructions. Go get me a book from the British Library. And Bedkar says, it'll only take you a day to copy out. So V.B. Kadam diligently copies out a book, sends it to him, Bedkar, and Bedkar writes back in September of 54, I believe, says, that's not the book I was talking about. The book I was talking about had, and then he gave some details that would actually allow Kadam or any Deweyan scholar to know he was really looking for the 1888 early work, The Ethics of Democracy, a book Dewey didn't really believe in anymore past 1904. So, so in 1954, Embedkar got two works. I speculated in print that the other work he got had to have been the 1939 essay, Creative Democracy. And sure enough, uh, when me and my uh, fellow archival researcher uh, Vijay Sarwade found jammed in Mumbai trunks uh, of Ambedkar's archives a typed copy of Creative Democracy. We, we knew that was a, you know, a true speculation. So, so what, you know, that piece is a wonderful piece in Dewey's because he not just talks about democracy as a, as a form of communicated experience, he talks about democracy as a way of life, a personal way of life. In Buddha and his gospel, way of life appears basically no time. 
in Buddha and Dhamma, way of life appears in the phrase some 22 times. So, so when Bedkar is developing and reading and rereading and revisiting Dewey and revisiting Buddhism, and here we have his full form of Buddhism. Now, one thing that changed was that section on Ahimsa. And that section on Ahimsa is what got him into trouble with many of the Buddhists of his time. For instance, the two, two of the surviving reviews of that book from his period, this one came from 1959, it was uh, you know, pseudo-anonymous uh, in the, the main vehicle of the Buddhist back then, the Mahabodhi Journal. It was an incredibly harsh review. And Bedkar is chastised for the Buddha and his Dhamma. This reviewer eventually concludes that it should be called Embedkar and his Dhamma because the Buddha's Dhamma is based upon peace and love, and Embedkar's Dhamma is based upon hatred. So the Buddhists had a, some Buddhists, many Buddhists, had a very strenuous reaction to Embedkar's reconstruction of Buddhism as an engaged philosophy. And so notice that this passage I put on the slide is where that reviewer engages ahimsa and the idea of ahimsa, you know, maybe being related to violence in this reviewer's eyes. Let's look at that section with new, with new eyes. So ahimsa, this section in Bedkar seems concerned with making a useful sense of ahimsa. So he asks explicitly in this section whether the Buddha's ahimsa was absolute or relative. And now we can see some terms in a new light. Was it a principle or was it a rule? And Bedkar continues to differentiate his notion of ahimsa from, let's say, the Jain version, which is a very extreme, do no harm to any living being. Remember, on December 5th, the night before he died, right before he went to sleep and never woke up, the last visitors from outside his household in Bedkar saw were Jain monks. So like pragmatism, Jainism was always a reference point uh, you know, for him to differentiate his philosophy. So, so you know, he, he ends up recrafting it as a principle of loving all so you don't wish to kill any. And then at the end of this section, if he couldn't make it more plain, he refers again to this distinction. Uh, to put it differently, Embedkar says, the Buddha made a distinction between principle and rule. And he did not want to make ahimsa a matter of rule. He enunciated it as a matter of principle or way of life. A principle leaves you freedom to act. And then Embedkar makes a turn of phrase that Dewey should have made because it's so clever. A rule either breaks you or you break the rule. And so Embedkar, like Dewey, wanted a, a guide, a normative guideline to how we act. In, in Bedkar's case, it came in religious garb, but a way to act and interact with people such that we have these flexible things known as principles being foregrounded, being emphasized. So in other words, things like ahimsa become a tool in, and the vows at uh, Diksha Bhumi or where we, what we now call Diksha Bhumi, uh, these kinds of things are tools to get us to reform those attitudes that are central to social democracy. Now, let me conclude by referring to one of his other works in the 50s, because like I said a while ago, that 1918 review began his career in many ways with a reference to Dewey on forces, energy, forces, violence. And at the end of his life, that exact same distinction coming from spring of 1916 was also still so formative. So in this unpublished work, he shows similarities between Buddha and Karl Marx, but he makes pains to differentiate Buddha from Karl Marx and Karl Marx's means. And so, you know, there, again, fascinating for me, he does this by making overt reference to his own professor, John Dewey. And he makes reference explicitly to this distinction we now know came from that class that he and Husher sat in, forces energy, forces violence. And he makes reference again to that central point that Dewey was enamored with on the eve of U.S. participation in World War I, the idea that you got to use force to do something, just be careful you don't destroy more things that other people value than, you know, than save. So it needs to be an intelligent use of force, not a blunt use of force, just fanatically pursuing your own ends. It needs to be a communal use of force. So Embedkar in this text uses this distinction to talk about the Russian Revolution of 1917 and to praise what he saw in Marx, Marx's communism, but with caveats. For instance, his caveats were very significant, and he came back to those semi-transcendent values that he ran with, that Dewey barely mentioned, but that were there in that March 1916 lecture. You know, the Russians, he thought, could get equality through use of force, through taking away money, through taking away power, through taking away freedom, but they can't give people liberty. They can't ensure everyone has liberty. Indeed, you have to take away liberty to get that equality, and they for sure can't ensure the fellow feeling that you need for fraternity or Maitri, as he would translate it into Buddhist terms, or love. So, so this was the balance that he needed us to strike in social democracy. And something like Marx, so fixated on one end, it couldn't balance all those ends. The Buddha, however, in Bedkar, wants to claim in these later works, sought ways to get all three of these. 
Another important part of my book, which I take pride in, but it's you know not everyone's deal, is that I emphasize the rhetorical. I emphasize the, the aspect of persuasion, of adjusting ideas to audiences and audiences to your ideas and how that changes with different audiences. And so that's communication. And I think Embedcar foregrounds communication. And I try to foreground that in my reading. And so let me conclude by just pointing out that he, he points to the Buddha's method as being primarily one of persuasion, of communication. And this is something many people who recover his Buddhism overlook. He envisioned Buddhism as being composed of conquering orators, as encouraging persuasive and powerful methods of convincing people that they ought to change their attitudes, their actions, and even their communities. So in the Buddha and his Dhamma, you see radical changes that now can be explained. You see him turn towards a gospel of love when he had every reason in the world to hate people who had oppressed him and his, his own kind for millennia. And you also see a vision of democracy and Buddhism as integrally connected and it's sometimes tragic. You know, you could, you could use violence to get your end, but like Dewey would say in the 30s, democratic ends require democratic means. And I think that was one dividing line between Marx as Embedkar saw him and Embedkar's philosophy as he expounded it. He couldn't take certain shortcuts that would resort to force as violence, destructive force. So if you want to explore any of these themes, there are many of them in my book, many more than I've talked about today. And there's many, much more to be written on this, obviously, in the future. But there's a rich vision of Embedkar as a historical figure and many more details there to make connections between. And there's a conceptual story We've talked about and we've heard people talk about Embedkar as a lawyer, as a politician, as an activist, and, and a Buddhist. Now we have a way of talking about him as a pragmatist. Now, none of these ways exclude other ways, but in, indeed, some of these ways will show new light in those other ways. So I thank you for your attention, and uh, I thank you for your role in pragmatism's past and pragmatism's future. Oh, okay. um, thank you, Professor. Uh, I always enjoy, uh, read, as a student of history, I always enjoy reading uh, your article, the way you use, uh, you hunt for the primary source and creatively use that. And today I, I was able to listen and see here uh, the way you uh, you use the prime, primary sources very uh, crea creative. Yeah, I wish I could have put all these pictures in the book, yeah, but yeah, you know, yeah, price. <laughs> So, uh, but you talk about to, uh, when you were uh, defining the pragmatism, you talk about there is a historical aspect and the conceptual as uh, aspects. And well, in historical aspect, you said there is a tradition of the scholars who read each each other and resist some 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 thoughts, and you locate Ambedkar in that way. And but uh, you. Uh, but while you're talking about the conceptual as aspect, you say is that uh, what truth, what works. So I think this, this if you will use this framework, so it may be very uh, problematic to locate Ambedkar and his philosophy uh, within this uh, framework, uh, which you put that truth, uh, what works. So I would like uh, you to reflect more on, uh, uh, would you like to define, uh, redefine uh, the way pragmatism, or you think is it an appropriate way to locate Ambedkar within this, or he goes beyond in what way uh, he goes beyond this, uh, this framework of uh, conceptual framework of pragmatism. Uh, I'll think uh, we will take some few sure. questions and then, so uh, uh, we first we will collect question from from the seminar hall, and then uh, we will take some question from um, of, uh, from online audience. So I think Nananja, please you. There you go. Uh, this, uh, this would be my intellectual query regarding the framework and the formulation vis-a-vis -vis Ambedkar. One would be on social endomosis. And, yeah. and, and Ambedkar starts before this process, and Devi starts with this process. So how do you reconcile a social endomosis? I mean, that is this vintage point in Devi. And Ambedkar starts before that in his conceptualization. This is the one. Second, 
Ambedkar also makes difference between teachers and gurus. Mm -hmm. And the guru would be Buddha, Kabir, and uh, Fule. Yeah. And the teacher would be, of course, Devi. And the teacher would be very much uh, intellectual, as you had referred. And the guru would be very ideological. So do you see difference in Ambedkar as an intellectual reference to Devi and the ideological reference to Buddha, Kabir, and Fule? And the third would be uh, of what happens to theory, I mean, yeah. uh, because uh, uh, Ambedkar does provide a theory and uh, what happens to theory in DV and pragmatism. And fourth and last one, can we reverse the uh, sequence and say that because the reason and uh, 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 experience are very important component in Buddhism, Mm -hmm. that the pragmatism is an extension of Buddhism. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of questions there. Hopefully I remember them all. I may not. Let's start with the theory one, because I think this is this is what attracted me initially as a grad student to pragmatism. And I, I still love this view. And I think it's, it has something to tell us, you know, in India, a lot of people do analytic philosophy. A lot of people do continental philosophy. But pra pragmatism is the middle path that's ignored by this. But uh, you know, the idea for pragmatist theory is a tool, you know, so think about it, right? The things we utter and we say they're true, you know, the, the kind of classical philosophical stance is a correspondence theory. These things latch on to some feature of the world that's just undeniable or is set or is certain or is sanatan. So that's the classical problematic in the West. And so Dewey, in many ways, think about his thought as rejecting that quest for certainty. Now, James, Peirce, and Dewey, what do they replace that with? Their view is that theories are good when they cohere with our past and future experience. That's what I shorthanded when I say truth is what works. Now, there's differences between them, and you know that's a different topic. But I mean, James's view is if you have a theory like why the lights don't work in this room, that implicates a certain course of experience, that predicts a certain course of experience, and it predicts certain experiences based upon certain interventions. So if I replace the light switch and the lights don't work, I revise my theory, it was the light switch. So it's a very compatible notion of truth with science, not foundational science that says there's laws of nature and Newton came up with them, but a fallibilistic view that when we say something's true, it's for right now, and we're open to future experience causing us to refine or change or maybe even abandon that account. So theory has no sanctity about it. It doesn't grasp onto the mind of God or the world as it is. It's a tool. So theories change as our needs change. That's the pragmatist uh, party line, as you, you might say, on, uh, on truth. So I think Embedkar loved that. So you see in his later works when he talks about the history of the Shudras or Untouchables, you know, he's honest. He's like, this is in preface to one of those later books. He says, well, this is stuff that we can't find hard and fast historical evidence on, even if we were back then and there. So we have to connect dots in a speculative fashion. But you see what he's trying to do. Can we usefully connect these dots? You know, and he wants to connect these dots in a way that liberate people and don't just further oppression. So that's very much a pragmatist instinct. In Riddle 22, Brahma is not Dhamma, in the unpublished riddles in Hinduism, he has one line, which I think Dewey came close to it. Dewey had a line in Problems of Men, where he said, philosophy is best when it returns to the problems of men. The problem Dewey thought was philosophy stated, abs philosophy was people writing books for people to write books. <laughs> you know, instead of action. And so Dewey criticized that view. And Embedkar had a line where he said, philosophy that doesn't return back to the lives of people to reconstruct their world is not real philosophy. That's what he thought was wrong with Vedanta. So, so that is like one line of pragmatism. So, so yeah, there, there's a sense where uh, they both were committed to this idea that philosophy ought to be practical. They were committed to experience being the touchstone. Theory is not the thing to fetishize. Experience is and improving the quality of experience is. You know, and of course they diverge and you could find creative new ways to put figures together. You could say Buddha was a, a pragmatist or Dewey learned a lot from Buddha. Now, as a historical fact, Dewey did not learn anything from Buddha. Uh, you know, so this is just, uh, this is what history is. So, so one thing I like to emphasize is Embedkar is a complex figure and there's so many ways to tell a story. Just like the world, I don't think there's one answer <laughs> to this riddle of Embedkar. Um, so sure, people don't have to talk like I talk about pragmatism, but I think certain ways of talking against this narrative ignore fact patterns. And some of those fact patterns are a bunch of annihilation of caste is echoed phrases 
or percentages from Dewey's work. So obviously Dewey's part of that story, whether we like it or not. Uh, fact patterns like the books he had and like the Adlerblum recollection. So yeah, you know, I, you could creatively say Buddha's, uh, you know, Dewey's a Buddhist, you know, like this, but the historical story is something someone has to tell at some point. I hope I answered some of your questions. Sorry, sir. I had... Yeah, I'm sorry that I uh, reached late, but uh, whatever no, I could gather from the lecture, uh, you had shown a slide when referring to liberty, equality, and fraternity. Mm -hmm. It's Ambedkar taking notes, and interestingly, you taking notes from those notes. Uh, there was this brief uh, mention of the church and sovereignty, the church as sovereign. And you argue that uh, unlike uh, Dewey, uh, Ambedkar emphasized on religion as a means. So uh, how do you see this uh, reflection of Ambedkar on the question of church and sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis the role of individual and that of the Sangha? which is not equivalent to the church. Uh, yeah. So uh, your thoughts on this? Yeah, and you know, this is a good question. And what's fascinating about those lecture notes is, right? I think everyone thinks that if you take a class from a thinker, that's gonna be exposure to that thinker's theory, right? And when you look at those notes, yeah, you know, and Dewey is so empathetic with the thinkers of his time. It's fascinating. Like all, most of these thinkers, Dewey thinks he goes beyond but he reconstructs the battles Locke is fighting and he reconstructs the rejection of the church, you know, in that historical period of the French revolution. And so that's just one thing I, I was, you know, shaken to, to read is that Dewey's thought doesn't come out as like a doctrine. You get Dewey's reading of some of these historical moments, but yeah, you don't. So, so the books by Dewey, you obviously get Dewey's rejection of religious certainty, you know? And so for Dewey, the church stood more for doctrine in Dewey's worldview and certain unchanging, unquestionable doctrines. And so Dewey rejects religion largely on that grounds. He writes a common faith in the 30s, uh, largely because you know a, a, he had, there's a letter that survives where a private in World War, you know, was, uh, someone in the army wrote him saying, hey, I read your stuff on religion. What kind of religion would you, you know, be fine with? And so Dewey then writes a, a religion that he can get behind, but it's very watered down. You know? And so it's definitely not an activist faith. And so Embedkar's Buddhism is that middle path between something that's too concretized, like you say, a church, and this kind of watered down view. You know, religion for Dewey becomes experiences of wholeness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Ambedkar uh, draws and draws some relation, as far as I could gather from those scattered notes, between church and sovereignty. Sovereignty being much bigger or larger than the question of means. Yeah. So, how would you kind of then relate the question of pragmatism? Because pragmatism would also mean instrumentality and unlike sovereignty, the notion of sovereignty. So, yeah, you know, I, you're, those terms, I don't quite catch the, the relation. What you were seeing in that, that, the notes was Dewey working through why you went from a radically individualistic philosophy in Britain to the more communitarian ways of thinking in the French Revolution. You know, and part of that, he then turns into the German story in Fichte, Marx, these kind of figures that wrestle with the idea of do ethnicities make a sovereign unit? Do ethnicities make nation states? So there's so much more fascinating things to say about that because, you know, Embedkar is dealing with this in the very diverse linguistically and otherwise context of India. But, but Dewey is just mapping this out. So, so I think Dewey's bigger point that surrounds that, and what's fascinating is I don't think this matters much for what Embedkar took, is that the French Revolution was rejecting some of those notions for these communitarian ideals. And then Embedkar takes those ideals and takes them out of the communitarian context, but uses them to critique uh, you know, the Sanskrit tradition. I mean, that's one thing I highlight in my book. Embedkar was a pragmatist in one sense. You could say he got ideas and ideals from Dewey, parts, 
some ideals Dewey didn't even care about in 1916 anymore. And he also got methods. And one of those methods that I think Dewey stood for and theorized about was reconstruction. And that's what you see Embedkar doing, even with the words of Dewey. When Dewey didn't fit him, Embedkar changes it, like Buddha, chip and chop at the past tradition to make what helps you in the future. So, so it's fascinating what he takes and what he leaves behind. Thank you. Uh, fascinating. Uh, I look forward to reading the book also. Uh, my question is about the method uh, only to the extent that, you know, when you talk about the two Buddha and the gospel and Buddha and the Dhamma, yeah. you mentioned something happened in between that yeah. caused it to change. So I was thinking, is there a way in which there are certain moments, say, for example, liberty, fraternity, equality, the moment of writing the constitution where that aspect of pragmatism or what he has studied from Dewey comes back more strongly. So in some senses, you know, you've already done so much of the fascinating reading about reading every <laughs> scrap. Yeah. But, but how much does the context matter? What of pragmatism does he foreground? Yeah. And thank you for assigning me to read all the constitutional debates. <laughs> That's like thousands of pages, but yeah, you know, it's, I've really gained a new respect for historical research. I've done like history of ideas work where I try to triangulate what Kant was up to in all these texts, but you know, thinkers go beyond what just makes it out in public or what survives. And so the context matters. And I really gained an appreciation for what kind of methods, not that are right, but what kind of methods I have a preference for in looking at how they differ from how other scholars approach this. And I'm a pragmatist, so I'm a pluralist. Let's do this in many ways. And it's not too useful to be in the business of excluding certain ways. So. So some thinkers will write nowadays on Embedkar and they'll connect to context, other thinkers, many thinkers, many uh, schools of thought, and that'll give you a different focus on Embedkar. And every method gains something and loses something. So the more you connect to, the less depth you can go into. You know, I even had to cut things, specifically that Buddha in his gospel story and save that for the next book because you just run out of words. And so, so yeah, you know, I'm sensitive to context. I think there's a sense where you start diluting the depth of the story in terms of one kind of train of meaning or one tradition. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, those, you know, the, he's dealing with all manner of things in wrestling with all the compromises in the constitution. That's one thing in this book. I don't engage the constitution much other than the little bits in the preamble that connect to this story because other thinkers know more about the constitution and that just take too much time. But, uh, but it's definitely part of this story, you know, and, and one thing I'll mention Pragmatist, another concept that unites pragmatists is a comfortability with contradiction, especially in the terms that will be known as pluralism. And I think Embedkar will be a pluralist in terms of means. You know, he wants social democracy, but he's going to experiment with a range of sometimes tension-filled methods of getting there, some legislative, some activist, some where he tells his Dalit audiences, like, you should convert, where he talks in a very individualistic fashion. So, so in a sense, all those kind of our intention, but if from a pragmatist sense, if it all works together to achieve the endpoints you want, why don't you do it? So, so constitution's part of that, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, maybe this mic. Uh, thank you very much. I'm swayed uh, by your presentation and persuaded as, as well. Uh, however, uh, uh, after. Uh, what I uh, came across after uh, listening in this question answer is that uh, it, your story is about making connections, but it probably does not tell the story of what does not get connected. Yeah. So if you have, uh, is there anything which does not get connected is part of the book or you want yeah, to I leave a lot of things out of the book but the uh no like, no the connection means the, the, the way yeah. you connect through yeah. your wonderful digging of uh, yeah. the archive so for instance you know i end this presentation by focusing on you know buddhism which is not something that is there in dewey and and i end the book you know i, I try to do this book from the early chapters are incredibly focused on the history. So for instance, the second chapter is detailed, but it had to be. It's an account of what Embedkar heard in Dewey's classes, because everyone says he took classes, but there's no details. Well, and I'm pretty sure Dewey's classes are the only class that I've seen in print, you know, my work, 
that um, that deal with the notes. I can't believe we haven't dug up Lasky notes or, you know, other teachers, Seligman, you know, so I, I look forward to other people digging deep holes in that. And I want to encourage that by digging my own deep hole. But by the end of the book, the last chapter is the vision, Darshan is what's on my mind, of Embedkar's Navayana pragmatism. And there I spell out five commitments that I think are unique to his pragmatism. Now, one thing I've gained an appreciation for is no one is absolutely unique. No one is absolutely an island. No one is absolutely separate. Even Dewey goes from Hegelian years to more rejection of Hegel, more Darwin. So uh, by the end of the book, though, I give a vision of Embedkar as a pragmatist that doesn't have the minute reference to Dewey, because I want my cake and I want to eat it too. I want to talk about the historical story, and I want to talk about Embedkar's philosophy in a new way, not just tell the arguments of annihilation of caste again, but talk about his philosophy in a different way. So, so you know, look at that and see if you're persuaded by this. But clearly his philosophy differs from Dewey in many ways. Um, you know, the religion angle, the focus on individualism, which I think much of the people that just talk about Embedkar as a philosopher miss. They miss the idea that he spent, you know, 200 speeches in his last year talk, talking to illiterate audiences, telling them to convert to Buddhism, you know, and that's something I've never seen a philosopher whose philosophy, as I read it, emphasizes individual effort and will as personal reconstruction, pragmatist reconstruction, and their life instantiates pragmatist personal reconstruction in the moment of his conversion. I've never seen that. No one swears into the Church of Dewey or Kant. No one puts, uh, you know, uh, you know, garlands on Plato's statue. So, so there, you know, there's this fascinating convergence of the life and the thought of Embedkar. You know, and, and that I really honor in my book. So, so yeah, you know, I talk a lot about Dewey, but by no means am I reducing embed card to just an echo of Dewey. That's why I call it the evolution of pragmatism. It's not the replication. It's not the redoing of it. It's a continuing tradition of people who have some commonalities, but always do new things. So I think this is so much better than saying embed card is an idealist, or he's a realist, or he's an Advaitin, or whatever school you want to attach him to. And it's better than making him sui generis and having all the right answers. And Bedkar would be the first one to say, don't make him a god. So, so I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to find that middle ground of how do we tell a new story and come up with new things to think about and talk about. But thank you. This is a good question. Question if anyone, otherwise we will. <laughs> okay. If there is no one, uh, we can request Dharanjay to. Sure. And... No. Yeah, yeah, here comes the microphone, though. That might help. It's on preamble. Because yeah. Preamble was part of this slice and the okay. pictures. And there's a debate that and this is, of course, objective resolutions by yeah. Nehru, and that become part of the preamble. But many argue that that is also, I mean, Ambedkar has also some take on making of Indian constitutions preamble. Yeah. And here you also see some kind of Fabianism. I mean, if Ambedkar is responsible directly for framing of the preamble, then there is a Fabian imprint on, on, on preamble of India. So Fabian. how do you link, if possible, Fabian and pragmatism? Yeah, well, the Fabian, you know, I think like Dewey, Ambedkar in many ways was a socialist who didn't like Marxism. You know, that's how one way to describe uh, Dewey. You know, Ambedkar had another teacher, Vladimir Simkovich. He took five classes from Vladimir Simkovich. And Simkovich was uh, a strident socialist who did not like Marxism. He was very non creative in the titling of his books. He assigned Ambedkar and his classmates. I know this for a fact because I found later syllabi that show that he was going back to his own book in his classes and it, Marxism versus socialism. You know, so, so Ambedkar in the background has these two thinkers, one that had objections to the kind of scientism of Marxism. Of, of the day. And then this ethical objection that Dewey had, which Marxism cuts too many corners when it comes to the means they consider applicable to pursuing the end. And so, so that's in my way of seeing what Embedkar has. Now, Fabianism, Embedkar gets you know, exposed to it. You know, I, I, I'm excited to see people write books on how that exactly influenced him. Okay, I'm excited. Uh, Dewey knew the Fabians from his time 
uh, with an, a rabid anti-Hegelian Davidson. They all had cabins next to each other and they would talk to the Fabians and such when they'd visit uh, you know, other places. But the, uh, so Dewey knew of these people, they were in the air and Bedkar took classes from them. So yeah, I'm sure that they influenced in Bedkar's uh, you know, social policy. What I was in, when intrigued by is that, you know, as Akash Rator says in his preamble that, you know, Bedkar forced certain concepts into that preamble and even discussions. And one of those that comes up there uh, I think it's Munshi is one of the people that talked about kind of the things, the, the tensions behind there, talked about Hegelianism. And, you know, in my book, I go into this even in more detail, but the dignity of the person, and Bedkar throughout his life would talk about reclamation of personality. Personality was a, a, was a God term from Dewey's early period. When Dewey was enamored by Hegelianism, he would constantly refer to the moral idea of personality. That was in that 1888 Ethics of Democracy book, where democracy is the realization of human personality comprised of liberty, equality, fraternity. So, so you know, that struck me as fascinating that in the 40s, Hegel kind of makes an entry into this. And Dewey's thought is one of those entry points, uh, as I've proven in my later chapters. And so, again, it's not just an importation of Hegel into the preamble. That would make it a nightmare to read, of course. But, the you know, it's these kind of problematics. How does the individual relate to the community and this neo-Hegelian idea of realizing the community in my person? That was something that Embedkar twists and takes into different ways. And it's fascinating. It's not the placid self-realization of Dewey's early thought. It's this assertiveness. I can do something about my community and make that realization all the more beneficial. Uh, but a complex story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Arvind Kumar, yeah, please. Please be brief. Uh, yes, H hello, Professor, can you hear me? Yes, uh, I'm yet to read your book, uh, but the latest anything that I have read is uh, the foreword that you've written, very engaging foreword to Savita Ambedkar's autobiography. Uh, my question is connected to, very similar to what Professor Saran has already asked on, you know, pragmatism and constitutionalism. Uh, I would want to know, and this is based on my latest experience during NTCA protest that happened in, you know, initially started in Jamia and it's spread over the country. Uh, Ambedkar's portrait and preamble was like, you know, very central to any protest side. So I am just wondering to know that if you can use uh, the very idea of constitutional pragmatism, uh, is it, is it connected to what you have already written or you think, you know, there's plethora of, you know, work yet to be done on the question of constitutional, constitutional pragmatism? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, great question. And thank you for chiming in. And definitely there's more to be done. And, you know, the, what structured my view of this is like those 1949 utterances in that speech where he says there's political democracy, then there's social democracy. And that social democracy in a Deweyan fashion, perhaps, is what I focus on because Embedkar's view is that you won't have constitutional, you know, morality or whatever if you don't have that kind of sense of public opinion, the habits. So, you know, but uh, this is a multi-faceted story. You know, someone could come in and talk much more about the Constitution, modern India, etc. You know, and I don't mean to preclude that, uh, but I do think habits have to be part of that. Um, you know, I think that's key for the Embedkar I see as emerging from this various fact uh, base. So, so the idea of how do we relate to our common humans and how do we form you know, community, even with people we disagree with and protest is one of those key ways where we can vigorously assert ourselves and we should be allowed the right to do that. And so Embedkar I think is an interesting symbol of this. I'll let other people weigh in on that, but I think historically his thought buttresses democracy at a variety of rich and deep levels. Okay, thank you. So I just would like to say thanks. I didn't, oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I really liked your presentation. Thank you. Uh, in my work, I have made a comparison between the oaths of Tibet uh, Tamang Buddhism and the oaths of Navayana Buddhism. Okay. In your presentation, you start off somewhere from the middle, I think from the eighth oath. But what foregrounds the 22 principles are very... Uh, 
not a very aggressive oaths, right? Uh, in my argument, I make that Ambedkar, Ambedkar doesn't listen to his own words and makes his rules rather than principles. Whereas the Tibetan, the oaths of uh, Tamang Buddhism make it into a principle, like uh, I will not regard Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh as gods, and so on and so on. So is it really, can it just be consigned to pragmatism, the oaths that, he made, uh, that you've pointed out? Because I think the first six oaths that foreground the other oaths uh, reveal a more in, reveal the more in reveal the intentions of the other 22 other oaths okay yeah i mean and definitely send me your work when it's ready to be sharing we publish this stuff in so many way, places we can't all keep track of it but um you know what what your question brings up are the assumptions we take to the stories we tell as scholars and that's one inside of pragmatism i love and richard rorty a modern pragmatist who engages continental thought uh, you know, he he is a fascinating and analytic thought. He's a fascinating figure because he goes maybe too far, but he says it's, you know, truth is a matter of what books your advisor has on their shelf or truth is what our friends let us get away with. But but think about the question. Are these vows one thing? That's what you your question kind of assumed. Right. Like, is there one meaning to these? And is Stroud getting it wrong? And and, you know, I, I don't mean to say that there's only one way to talk about these, this column of rules, this column of principles. What I mean to say is there's a very viable way to read these as pragmatist. It'd be tougher to read these as continuing and appropriating Marxist you know, themes, okay? So I think there's probably ways to talk about them in reference to other traditions of Buddhism uh, of his day, you know? But there's also a way to talk about them as having uh, at least one way of differentiating the sort of principles or certain rules they give you. And one thing about principles and rules, one thing about pragmatism, pragmatists abhor dichotomies. That's one basic commonality. Nature didn't operate in dichotomies. There's continuums. So for instance, Descartes, soul or material body. This is a classic philosophical dichotomy that the pragmatists say generates problems and you solve that by dissolving the dichotomy. So things like principle and rules, never think that like everything in ethics, if that's even part of the world, it's probably part of our way of thinking about the world. Uh, you know, Don't think that everything in ethics divides into these two piles. Think about it as a useful distinction. You know, so I could talk about my mind, I could talk about my bodily health, but don't get fooled into thinking I am composed of two separate things in the world, body and mind. So same with principles and rules. And I'm sorry if I kind of let talk down the path where it's like these have to be considered as rules, these have to be considered as principles. So long story short, I like where you're going with this, and there's a sense that we could tell new and different stories about it as well. But, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But uh, what's it, what prefaces the book is important, right? Yeah. So what prefaces the other rules where you start off from are the six rules, which are explicit denials of Hinduism. Yeah. I'm just saying we cannot consign those rules just to pragmatism. There's a character of resistance, resisting Hinduism as it is in uh, Tamang Buddhism. So I'm just saying you can't just consign the entire thing to pragmatism. Uh, well, I'm not consigning the entire thing to pragmatism, but notice what I've made the point, and I do this in my book in more detail, that a key part of Embedkar's appropriation of pragmatism is this renewed emphasis on individual effort. And the other assumption of your question that I don't agree with is I don't think the rules are sequential. I don't think there's nothing necessary to say rule one is essential to two, essential to three, essential to four. And, you know, I'd like to see your argument for that, but, you know, maybe you can, maybe you convince me that I'm looking at them the wrong way. What I did on that slide was I just grabbed, I cut and pasted the ones that fit the kind of parameters of a concrete rule defined as something that's specific that might not help you in different contexts. And principles are defined as intellectually abstract that could apply to a range of known and unknown contexts. So that's the operationalization I'm using there, right? So, so yeah, I don't mean to imply that you got to start with rule seven. And I might even argue against saying that, you know, rule one through five sets up rule 20, you know, and, and notice that at, the, at that ceremony, as I read it in Boz, he doesn't give a big speech contextualizing those principles. He, just, they, he repeats them and then swears an oath to the Sangha and stuff, you know, and so, so yeah, the, the Diksha ceremony is fascinating and you and I might disagree on parts of it, but this is part of the fun, <laughs> you know, a lot more to think about something we haven't put a lot of thought into. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, I would like to thanks uh, our uh, 
uh, Dr. Straub for the wonderful lecture. Thanks to Dr. Pratima Banerjee and Dr. Sarin, our director, for inviting him and arranging this seminar. Thanks for Ayodhya, Sachin, and uh, Praveenji for helping to make all the arrangement. Thanks for all the audience for coming online and offline. Thanks. So we thank you. <laughs>